I think uh, archiving details, learning from the past experiences is so important. We have a lot of data, but how to turn the data into the knowledge, wisdom, insight, which help us to make decisions for preparations, investment to the long futures. So I think uh, how to turn the huge data as an asset into the meaningful, legible uh, information is an exciting, also very critical challenge. Today, uh, we have a very great uh, three panelists in my session. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Jake Poet. Jake, are you here? Yes. He's a founder and also executive director of Data Kind, an organization that brings together leading data scientists with high impact social organization to better collect, analyze, and visualize data in the service of humanity. So next, also panelist is Wei Sandy. He's a deputy executive secretary of National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reductions. And uh, since 2000, uh, he's responsible for international collaborations on disaster risk uh, reductions. Then third, I'd like to introduce Professor Fumihiko Inamura from uh, uh, Tohoku University. Yeah. And uh, he's also uh, studying about uh, simulation, like uh, for tsunami warning, and also human science for evacuation process. So now I'd like to start uh, with the presentations of uh, Jake. Sure. And I think it's my seat, so. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no it's okay. <laughs> You're important. I'll go over there. After, <laughs> after, after my talk, yeah. Overstepping my bounds already. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It is a huge honor to be here amongst so many people doing so many great things in disaster preparedness. Uh, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what I've been doing for the past year, which is a little bit outside of the disaster realm. So I want to start by asking everyone to think about the ways that data is actually touching your lives every day, not just in a crisis. So for example, if you've gone to get a movie in the past, you probably didn't go to a movie store, right? You went here to Netflix, which recommended a movie for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you went to figure out how to travel, you probably used Google Maps instead of an old guidebook. Yeah, data is driving all of our decisions every day, from how we get places, to what products we decide to buy, to even who we decide to be friends with. And this is all a very exciting time because all of this data that's being created by every interaction we have with each other, either through a computer or through a cell phone, means that we have vast archives of data that can be mined to help us make better decisions about how to live our lives. Now that's very exciting, but if you think about where most of the efforts are going in data analysis and statistics, the vast majority are to things like this. Picking movies, finding friends, buying products, things that make our very comfortable lives ever so slightly more comfortable. And it seems that if we have access to all this data, we should be doing more with it than just making sure that when you all leave here today, you know exactly where to go to get the cheapest deal on an iPad. Now, I'm from the data world, so I work with people like this, data scientists. I know a lot of the people in this room are as well. And if you are, you're probably very excited because you know that these people don't just work with data in their day jobs. These people work on data all the time. Nine to five, increasingly people are becoming involved in things called hackathons. Uh, raise your hand if you've, if you've been to a hackathon. Okay, a few people. So for the uninitiated, a hackathon is a weekend event where developers and data people get together and just try to come up with cool stuff. And this is exciting because they're not just doing this through a, a company, they're sitting in rooms together like this, working out products. So I remember going to my first hackathon and being so excited because I thought this is how we're gonna make change. This is how we can actually analyze all this data to do really important things in the world. We'll get together, we're gonna to make things that are going to make positive change and have impact and change the world. And, and what we came up with was really unfulfilling. A lot of what the people were coming up with were apps to help you park your car or apps to help you find local deals. And that felt to me to be a little bit disappointing. 
So thankfully, there are people like you guys out there, people in the social sector who are collecting data from crises, collecting data when there are problems in the world. And as you know, a lot of these social organizations are awash in data, right? There's data coming in from the field, there's data coming in from maps, there's data about resources. And more than that, there's groups like Ushahidi, the World Bank, governments making huge archives of data available to groups like the UN, to the, excuse me, the Red, ooh, excuse me, the Red Cross, other groups like that. But the problem is they don't necessarily have people to help them work with it, right? They, so all that great potential to help them analyze it and understand what's going on gets lost. So we wanted to connect the people who knew what to do with data, the statisticians and analysts who weren't at research universities, but at places like Google and Amazon, with the people who had lots of data but didn't know what to do with it. And that was why we founded Datakind, this nonprofit, to connect people who had that part-time energy, to connect them to these social causes. And I'll give you some examples of what this looks like. In the United States, the New York Civil Liberties Union is a group that looks out for human rights in New York. And they wanted to understand if the police were being fair, if they were using racial discrimination. And what's cool about this problem is there's a big archive of data about all police activities in New York. So they had data available, and they had a good question. But the problem they had was that this is the data. And if you're a nonprofit or a social group, what do you do with this? Right? You've got all the data that's come in, but now what? So they worked with volunteers from Datakind over a weekend, and they came up with this instead. This is a map that shows the number of stops that police are making in New York by district uh, based on race. And so now they can start to see things. They can start to focus in on various hot spots in New York and say, oh, we need to understand what's going on here. So this helped them turn that mess of data into something they could use. Now, another group is the Grameen Foundation. They have a wonderful program in Africa where they're bringing information to subsistence farmers via cell phone. So subsistence farmers don't know what weather conditions would be like. They don't know what the crop prices are in the town next door. So Grameen Foundation brings people in with cell phones to ask them to do queries to say, what do you want to know, to help bring them information. They have all this cell phone information now that could help them do their jobs better, but it also looks like this. They didn't even know who the good workers were, whether they were having an impact. So again, they built a visualization with our team that shows the worker uh, skill breakdown. And the way to interpret this map is that the good workers are showing up in blue across the rows, and places where workers are falling short is in the yellow area. Now, there's a lot of question about uh, how to judge goodness, but what this helped them do is look into that data and learn more. And lastly, I'll close by showing the United Nations Global Pulse is a fantastic group, collects data from all around the world so they can help find uh, evidence of humanitarian crises before they happen. They did a great survey called the Global Wellbeing Survey. They asked everyone around the world by cell phone, how happy are you? It was a great advance in mobile technology, but the result, again, is data like this that they didn't even know how to use to get the basic questions on who responded to the survey. So they worked with volunteers to build this visualization that showed how people responded over time across the globe. And this helped them see where they had reached, which countries they'd missed, and where they needed to do more. Now, we've seen lots of mapping today. A lot of people in this room have these skills. And so you may say, this is very straightforward. And you're right. It is very straightforward. Ushahidi could do this like instantaneously. But what's interesting is that if you are a social group or a nonprofit, you don't necessarily have these skills. There's this question about when you have this archive of data, who has the expertise to apply statistical analysis to it? And that's something that we don't have a lot of options for in the data science world and are trying to bring together. So as Lou from World Vision came with a, a, a request this morning to say, we'd like to know, can we federate out these tasks? Can we say when we have an archive of data, how do we get people to look at it? I'm coming with the reverse question. We have groups of people who are really good at doing this, but don't have a lot of ways to connect to this. So I'd like to know, with your groups, when you have disaster data, or when you're trying to use this data to do more than just map it, how can we work with you guys? We want to bridge that gap so that we can do more with this data than just figure out how to find movies, but actually figure out how we can help change the world. So thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you for my chair and also the great visualization examples. Mm -hmm. yeah. no problem. Thanks. So now, uh, good afternoon. I'm Wei Sun Li uh, from National Science and Technology Center for Disaster Reduction. Actually, disaster is not a new thing to Taiwan. Like earthquake, like the typhoon, like flash flood, like landslide, like the debris flow, it happens almost every day. Yeah. 
Since the 1999, we think we had a lot of investment, both about money and human resource on disaster reduction and improvement of emergency response. We think we have done something, but about three years ago, 2009, Typhoon Morocco teaches us something new. As we know, in disaster management, we always say we learn from disaster, but we also learn from failures. From the Typhoon Morocco, we learn something new. Traditionally, we think about isolated area, we think maybe it's no transportation, but in this case, we found information and communication <coughs> is also important for the isolated area because some area during a Typhoon Morocco lost contact for several days, but these are the most affected area during a Typhoon Morocco. This is something we're going to look at. About 700 people get killed and list as one of top 10 events in 2009. Mm -hmm. But what we found from Typhoon Morocco first, we have a lot of system during Typhoon Morocco period, but the problem we don't have system of system if commander wants to know if the shelter is safe enough from flood, sorry, he has to compare two graphs together. They cannot overlap two layers together because at that time we don't have the system of integration. So the problem is we need information integration system. And the second one, we have a lot of emergency responders try to fill a lot of form, try to report back to the emergency operator, but most are in tax form they cannot transform into geospatial information. Although we want to help, after we re-examine the data, it's impossible to do it in a very short period of time. So we try to talk to the emerging responder, why give us a basic information about geospatial distribution like the address? So it's a turning point for us. Gradually, our government agreed to have information integration on the national platform. But my center, NCDR, we are not a government official. We just the government hire scientists to do the job. For at the very first beginning, it's not an easy job. As we knock the door, say, if we want to open the gate, information gate with NCDR, of course, the answer is no. Why? So from our observation, there are two challenges to overcome. First, about mutual trust. They don't trust us at the very first beginning. Second, they are afraid of openness. They are afraid if the data open, maybe something bad happened to them. So how about have the solution to solve the problem? We proposed two ways. First, be their friend, be their partner. So we spent several years to spend time together with a lot of government agency to build our mutual trust. Second, we need top-down determination. Our vice peer instructed all the government agency have to open the gate to NCDR. So recently in my center, we tried to uh, integrate about the information, totally about 120 big data set generated by 20 government agency. But we are not in charge of maintain or try to build up some hardware because we try to have information integration. So we spend a lot of time talking about the protocol, talk about the transformation way, and also talking about some security thing. So how we use the data during the emergency, especially for typhoons, we receive a lot of big data set. For example, this information from Central Weather Bureau, CWB. Further thing, we transform the big data into some model parameters. So we can predict about the precipitation. Based on the precipitation, we know the flood potential and the landslide potential. And the most important thing, the obvious achievement in the recent since the 2001 is we try to decrease the death toll. Apparently in 2010, one could claim about death toll over 200. Of course, we had another one in 2009, Typhoon Morocco. But we found the result, we do decrease the number of death toll and also by the measure of the evacuations. This example, right at Typhoon Morocco, why the big data is so useful for early evacuation. After Typhoon Morocco, we have definition of early evacuation, two criteria. First, in daytime. Second, no traffic problem. We don't want to evacuate and emergency responder rescue life for evacuation. This example, when Typhoon Fanabi was approaching to southern part of Taiwan, the Lai'i village already suffered something after Typhoon Morocco. You can see the picture at your left-hand side. So on the date of the September 16th, in the afternoon, 3 p.m., we issued the evacuation order. 
about 32 hours ahead of the debris flow happen. The debris flow cover 50 more household. If people still in the village, we cannot imagine, we cannot imagine the consequence. And think about how to use the public-private partnership to have information dissemination. If you have a chance to visit Taiwan, you will see a lot of convenience stores around the corner, along the street. Uh, we probably have 10,000 convenience stores island-wide and 5,000 owned by the 7-Eleven. So our water resource agency reached a consensus with 7-Eleven. First, you see the screen. Use their LCD panel at cashier to disseminate some local weather features. This is one thing. Another thing is if any flood happens, especially in the urban area, the 7-Eleven will tell us about the flood situation. It's kind of a two-way communication. This is another solution we try to not use the big data, but also collect some social data. And uh, how to use the big data? First, become the open data. Most important thing, some personal and action actionable information. Traditional, we think about some early warning system. We use a lot of model, we use a lot of big data, but we can predict the hazards is only. It's enough, not enough. So we add more social vulnerability so we can predict the impact, but it's still good for the government side, not good for the, any person. So about the human-centered early warning system, we have add more social information. This is why we have collaborated with NGO, try to make the prediction came for reaction, came for response, not just tell you, oh, you are in danger, but like nearby, there is shelter. Please go to the shelter as soon as possible. So this is the direction in Taiwan we're going to use from big data to open data and in the future for the personal information. Thank you. Thank you for sharing us about the challenge to make data really open, available to everybody. So now I'd like to ask the Professor Inamura yeah. to talk about <coughs> data. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Inamura uh, from Tohoku University. It's great for me to provide you the idea uh, of the new uh, archive for the 2011 earthquake tsunami in Tohoku. Uh, this is the slide. The, you can see the name of the archive, which is, which is the Michinoku Shinroku Den, meaning the name of the Michinoku is the old or former Tohoku area. We use the old names because we uh, try to compile not only the 2011 event, but also the past uh, over the 1,000 or 2,000 uh, years on the historical literature. And Shin Lok De means the earthquake and uh, tsunami related, the recorded system, and we would, would like to transfer the, this data to the uh, other people in the world. So, uh, and we, sorry, we just developed this archive project in the new research institute of Tohoku University, which name is International Research Institute of Disaster Sciences. So consists of the not only engineer scientists, but also uh, for the natural, but also social science involved in the new research institute, and also medical member from the school also joined. So it is very unique. So uh, uh, this is the idea of the total archive in Michinoku. So we try to co collect all kind of data related with the damage, uh, hazard, and the impact uh, before and after 2011. Sorry, this is sorry uh, Japanese, but you can see the many, many ideas uh, through the Chinese characters. So <laughs> we have many, many video data, uh, picture data in the digital format, but also many, many oral uh, data from the residential people along the coast. And uh, in order to collect the, this kind of data, uh, we uh, open the uh, system and with four purposes. The one of purposes is uh, to understand the mechanism of the huge earthquake tsunami in 2011, which had never recorded in Japan. 
even though you, we have many, many historical, historical events of the earthquake tsunami, but we never have such a large earthquake, more than magnitude nine. So we try to understand what happened, and we should propose a new uh, mechanism of the huge earthquake tsunami. And the second purpose is to support the mit uh, mitigation effort to other area. For example, west part of Japan, we are expecting another earthquake and tsunami in Tokai to Nankai, so which probability is still very high. So third purpose is to uh, support also the, some uh, practical mitigation uh, for the people in the affected area and uh, staffs in the town and the prefectures. And the fourth purpose is to uh, transfer this kind of data for a long time. So we collect this kind of data with a specific uh, formatted, and we try to record as long as possible. So this is the image of the uh, system. You can see uh, the system in the center. So we need input and output system. Especially output system should be related with the, some affected area, especially people and some government and some official people. So we get the, uh, many, many information from them and also we should return back to the, some result and some knowledge or lesson to them. So we have the input and output system, but it's uh, very, very much uh, collected. So uh, this is uh, skip, <laughs> and I would like to show you the, some example uh, which already collected in the archive, but uh, you can see here, okay. So uh, this is the example uh, of the available data in the website already. So one of them is the uh, field data about damaged area for the uh, earthquake tsunami. So we can uh, estimate some damaged area through satellite or aerial photo. But uh, at the same time, we need to go to the site or field to make sure that some houses are completely destroyed or partially destroyed. So we are collecting such kind of data on the field as well as the some available uh, satellite or aerial, aerial photo area data. And the second one is the trend analysis uh, to provide us what keywords uh, in the news are now significant or not according to the time. So we put the trend analysis in the archive system. And of, of course, we are many, many experts uh, to make a simulation uh, which can be used for the direct uh, prediction uh, for the earthquake tsunami damage. So we are now collecting all kinds of data uh, for the predictions. So, uh, and uh, one of our unique system is, sorry, uh, is here uh, showing. The, we are collecting the many, many data uh, from the uh, many digital uh, system or other uh, major data. But sometimes we need the, some data uh, from the site, which we cannot expect. So that's why we requested the people to go to the site. So any kind of information or some experiences from victims or people in affected area should be collected. So that's why we have the team uh, of collecting the data, uh, which are uh, survivors and some retired people uh, in the city and the prefecture, including the other area. So now we are uh, collecting the big variety of the data, uh, which we cannot expect. So for example, the, some uh, survival experiences uh, from, survive, uh, from the people in affected. So this is the example of the archive data. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Inamura-sensei.
How many of you have seen the stone monument in Tohoku areas, about 300, saying the message, don't build a house below this yes. line height? How many of you have seen it? OK, uh, there are many, many uh, earthquake tsunami in Tohoku areas, in uh, Meiji, yes. also Ashura. People try to archive, then di disseminate yes. that idea to the next generations, yes. but have kept failing. Yeah. So it's very impressive to see all the data, yes. but how you can make an engine mechanism mm. to remind them, for example. Yes, for me, like a Twitter bot is a great example, yeah. which reminds you. Yeah. So data is great, but how to make future people, our descendants, make good use of those data? Yeah. First question yes. to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So one of the uh, purpose in our archive is collect the uh, available digital data right now. And it can be installed into the computer. But uh, this kind of data uh, sometimes cannot uh, available or cannot inform to the uh, people who are interested in the uh, uh, prevention or mm -hmm. mitigation. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, now uh, putting the, some this kind of data into the uh, digital museum system, mm -hmm. AR. So whenever uh, people go to the affected area, uh, we can access this data mm -hmm. on the site. Mm -hmm. So when we can go, already the damaged area cleaned up, but we can see such kind of data through the, some uh, AR system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Jake, it's very impressive to see all the data, but also talents, experts who can analyze the data, extract the meanings, mm -hmm. also visualize, especially I'm a big fan of the big news, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journals, all those amazing uh, visualizations. And, uh, but also this abstraction really requires the talent. Mm -hmm. Towards the future, how, how people can make good use of this technique because many things changes, yeah. but still they want to understand how we can use the lessons we learned this century in a very different context. To do so, just data and the visualization might be not enough. How to help people think using a more abstract model. So how from go beyond from data to the model to think with, with some set of the parameters mm. which future people can tweak to make a decision? I think it's a very good question, you know, how to think about data in a way that uh, will <clears throat> be able to be tweaked by future generations is a, is a big question. And I think a lot of it actually comes down to some questions of data literacy. literacy. You know, we're running into a problem right now where data is exploding uh, and the people who understand how to use it or even the public to think about it is not growing as quickly. Yes, I understand. And yeah, I, I think that's something that you're starting to see bridged now with people coming up with uh, you know, data science programs mm -hmm. or looking at ways to educate data scientists uh, so that we could have build systems that could be used towards the future. But I think right now we're sort of in the situation where we're trying to bridge that gap with the people who know what to do with it now and apply those skills to I see. that data now. But you're totally right, a visualization that's just a static result of this data isn't going to be relevant maybe in the next generation. And, and we really need people who can take that data and make sense of it I so see. that future generations can look back and, and understand that a little bit better. Maybe there's a lot of the emphasis on the data, but only when data is abstracted based on an understanding of, for example, causality chain, <laughs> then transform into <laughs> system dynamics or event driven simulation then future people may have more usage than the past data yeah. of the reference. Yeah. So maybe data science may should also evolve analyzing, abstracting the mechanism, say causality chain, then turn into the simulation or analytical models uh, to augment the human like brains. Uh, that, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> if you know how to do it, let's do it together. That would okay. be great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. yes. Also, uh, Wenzhen, thank you very much for talking about the uh, challenge to become a friend to the government, get data. But what's prevent government? Why they hesitate to <laughs> release the data? I can think many reasons, but I'm curious. What's a... What's a major challenge to them? Yes, why they are say, afraid of, or mm. they don't be responsible for something because of noise, or what would... would... I think the first thing, most of government officials, they are afraid of mistakes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Since they found mistakes, since they are 
in the guilty. So the people were challenging if they do good job good enough. So I first think afraid of mistake. I see. The second thing sometimes is a huge job, especially when you try to maintain the data. Right now, I mean the data set not just build up once. We need frequently update. I think see. about the resolution. So it's also the huge job. Sometimes they consider about the budget. They are mm -hmm. also reluctant to do furthermore mm -hmm. about how to improve the data. I think the two major reasons. I see. Yeah. Maybe if they believe data must be perfect, otherwise they can release. Oh. That oh. really prevent us from making good use of. So any, any data has a noise. <laughs> we should accept this right. noise. Right. Then, but uh, you said also good enough mm -hmm. to make some decision. So it sounds very important, new value systems. Mm. Many people try to pass your perfect data. <laughs> right. It never exists. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Well, and, and if I could jump in on that note, I'm mm. curious if you've seen this way, Sun, where there are cases mm. where private companies can fill in some of that data that's good enough in place of yeah. governments. Good so, enough. You know, we're seeing cases where, uh, well, Google, for example, right, is able to see search trends for terms that signal a recession coming up. Yes. Whereas in the US, the government only puts out a survey from the Bureau of Labor Statistics about recessions, so it might be monthly, but maybe even annually. So if there are places where companies who have all this data they're collecting just by people using it could somehow make those archives available as uh, replacements maybe to some government mm -hmm. data. I yes. wonder if that's something you're seeing as well or mm -hmm. think there's promise in. Yeah. And the Japan yes. case, the Japanese government before the 2011 hesitated to provide yes, many, many uh, yes, I uh, uh, hazard analysis. But uh, this time we failed to predict uh, for the asking tsunami yeah. uh, with the very large scale, even though some researcher pointed out some possibility, mm -hmm. but which is still discussing uh, on the uh, some availability. But mm -hmm. now Japanese government shifted shift to the more open uh, this kind of the information, and uh, they try to uh, evaluate the maximum uh, scenario, mm -hmm. uh, which. Uh, might be uh, useful for the future prediction. That's encouraging. Also, uh, Wei Sen uh, slides has a mm. word predict three times, which yeah. I like it. <laughs> Not just yeah. learning from, from the past, mm. but using data as an engine, mm. maybe as a model mm. or decision tree to help people make a decision. So I think a predict for the futures, also choosing the best actions yeah, of crisis response yeah. seems yeah. very important. We talk about the uh, potential noise of the bug in the data. Uh, this clock says 15 minutes, but I, I don't believe I do have still 15 minutes. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, <laughs> but maybe it's nice time, time to open the discussion to the floor because I think I have less time for my session. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so any questions or comments to these experts? Okay, the gentleman in the first row. Please identify yourself. And, uh... Hello, my name is Keith Olofsson from NetHope. Uh, we've been collecting a lot of data, uh, mm -hmm. as risk data and, and you know about hazards. We saw both you know what you were showing, Wesen, as well as uh, Margareta was showing us earlier. One thing is to make sense of the data for us, but how can we take it a step further and, and take all that data, all that knowledge that we have now collected or are collecting, and present it in a better way to the people so that they actually make actionable change yeah. in their behaviors or, or decide to do the uh, mm -hmm. evacuations uh, when we're telling them that, can we use things like you know, more you know, data scientists that can take the data, not just create a fancy map, but actually help us take that then and create storytelling that explains that to people in, in words they understand. Mm. I like, and that's to all I, of I you. like the term, actionable change. Mm. So who wants to take this question? Mm. Well, I'll start by saying that's a fantastic question. It's something mm. that a lot of uh, groups, nonprofit and otherwise, are wrestling with. We've got this data. We know a little bit about what to do with it ourselves. But how do we present it to the world to actually make a change? Yes. And it's, of course, the uh, classic problem, even mm. before big data ever came on the scene. But um, certainly, there are. You mentioned a very important word, storytelling. A lot of groups are very interested now in how to take that data and make it compelling. Where they may have previously put out a graph or a spreadsheet, now there's this question, could we use an infographic or an interactive 
to get people involved. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that actually succeed. So um, Kiva recently put out their last report, uh, which instead of being just a write-up, was a huge interactive site where you could look at where all the money had gone, where it had come from. Now, that was to reflect on them. That's not quite getting to the point that Geasley's mentioning, which is how do you then let people make act, uh, decisions around this and actually act on this? And this is something that uh, I don't know if there's a, an easy answer for, but you know, my, obviously my soapbox is that you should team with some statisticians to build some of those decisions uh, and build some of those interactives that people could use. Um, but I, I think increasingly that's something we're going to need to answer as a group, is how can we uh, actually get this out there in a way that people are going to, to act on? And um, I, I feel like I'm sort of just rephrasing your question, so maybe that's more indication that we're figuring that out, and I think that's what the people in this room are figuring out. So I'll weigh in with an answer after I think a bit more about yeah, it, but yeah. it's a very common problem. Yeah, yeah, it is also a very great question. So I can say that the experiences and the lessons in the past should be carefully shared with other people with different conditions. Uh, because uh, uh, we have the case of the 2011, it occurred March and afternoons. If it is occurred uh, in the another place and another time, there's some effect might be changed. So we can put the, a kind of prediction uh, with simulation and some experiences. So though they're very, very, uh, uh, I, I hope, affect to the, some people, but uh, not sure there's some good uh, system. Still, we are doing that. Uh, according to my experience at Typo Morocco, I found a knowledge transfer kind of evo evolution uh, process and interactive ways. How do you say? I mentioned in my PowerPoint about early evacuation. So people living on the plain area seems to be a good idea. But think about people living in the mountain area, especially our indigenous tribe, they don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So after they receive new knowledge, they think, maybe we can find some emerging shelter near my village. So the kind of the interactive process, because we give them some knowledge, they think about, yes, I understand the risk. Let's change our behavior. But like Gisley asked, who is best the storyteller? I think it's not from government official. It should be the NGOs. NGOs can have the long-term company with affected people. So in our process, we try to train some NGO, try to use our science and technology transfer into spoken language. No use a lot of those scientific terms. So during the, the knowledge transfer, how to make our knowledge uh, uh, actionable and acceptable is also very important. I think Wei Sun made a really good point. I want to just add on very quickly, I apologize, which is that the, everyone talks about data and big data as if it is the new key, right? But it's, it's just an extension of a lot of what we've already done, what we've done in the past. We've always collected data. It's just that there's more of it available. So if you want to change people's behavior, go back to the ways that NGOs and other groups are already changing their behavior and use the data to back it up. But nothing intrinsically, no, no infographic or story you can pull just from the data is going to do that on its own. So I like that point. Next question or comments. Uh, my name is from Tanaka from Senda. I'm a developer. In the Taiwanese case, uh, before 30 x something, people were able to evacuate. Maybe in Japan, it's unlikely for us to evacuate at such an early timing. So what kind of power did you utilize in that case? So could you just elaborate more? It's about early evacuation. Yes, Ali Satya was yeah. how, how this could happen. Yes, first, because uh, we use some story like the risk communication is very important. So people aware of the dangers right after Typho Morocco because still a lot of debris in the mountain area. Mm -hmm. So how to do the evacuation first? The local village should have consensus. It's a very important thing. Second, you must prepare for everything, especially people don't want to be evacuated. So in the process, we will ask our military sector to prepare vehicles to transport all the indigenous people to the shelter. But the problem is sometimes they stay too long in the shelter, they are complain because mm -hmm. their poverty, yes. their livestock, their the crops in the mountain. So we must find the balancing point. What is the best period for people in the shelter and how to active the system for yeah. the evacuation is both important. Thank you. Last question? Okay.
Yes, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Michael Ernst. I'm with uh, USAID Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, and I'm very impressed with the presentations today and all of them, uh, especially this panel's. And the thing that comes to mind for me, we do a lot of work uh, at the community level, especially focused on community-based disaster risk reduction. I was very impressed with the earlier presentation about how communities can handle their own data. Um, for me, being involved in the field, it, it really comes down to communities being able to get access to this technology and understand their risk. And, and you've talked about a lot of the big data sets that they might be able to access. But a lot of what has to happen somehow is that the communities get used to this in normal times. So that's a part of the tools that they use, and then they can access what uh, the, these larger data sets, and in fact, contribute to them. In fact, they, the community can be the source for your data and your larger big data sets. The, the thing that we worry about on the disaster side often is if communities are left out, and that has come out from a lot of these presentations. So really, one of the things that, that uh, is a str strong interest for us is how to engage the, the private sector, the public sector, the NGOs, uh, and the communities themselves so that they're the ones that are empowered and are, in fact, the ones that are, are con controlling the response to some level and how we can get governments and everyone to agree to coordinate in support of those needs at the community level. I think about the community level, they need to prepare before the disaster happened. Because during the disaster moment, I think it's impossible for them to access a lot of big data. So how to build out the plan, uh, in our case, of course, once we depend on NGOs. So the train the trainer policy, we, we train the NGO to help local community. But during the process, two elements should be emphasized. Respect, local knowledge, and local experience, very also important. Don't think advanced technology is only a solution. Sometimes respect local knowledge and local experience. Yes. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> so I agree. So the, just to, the data or archive provide the old data, so which can be uh, analyzed, analyzed by the community uh, with the experiences and the purposes. So sometimes the purpose of the community are diverse. So different uh, discussion with different uh, purposes. So we need a kind of, a kind of arrangement uh, to use. Uh, so some, the key person uh, might be very necessary, I think. And I completely agree with uh, what Wei Sun said earlier about needing the communities to be that bridge. You know, we have lots of people excited to look at the data who do that every day, but don't know the, the cultural conditions, the, the situation on the ground, which is why it's so important to partner with the advocacy groups and communities who are doing this already. And you mentioned an interesting point of training people in this technology ahead of time or being prepared for this. And I think the one way I've seen an interesting solution to that are the groups who are reverting, or inverting that and taking technology and communication that already exists and piggybacking on those cultural norms. So um, in Africa, there's a, a, a program called Text Me Back, uh, where if you run out of cell phone minutes, you can send a message to your friend saying, hey, I can't, I'm out of money on my cell phone, but you can, you can, I can text you to say, call me. And that's something that's very culturally common there. And so a group started adding uh, information about where they could get HIV testing at the bottom of those texts. They teamed with the telcos. They teamed with that community to get that message out via technology that was already used. Now, that's not an immediate crisis, but they found when they did that, the amount of people going and getting HIV testing skyrocketed. So there was an interesting use of not saying, how do we train people up and learning about this technology to go find HIV testing centers? They instead used technology they already used and added that information into it. So I think that's sort of, I really like those examples of people uh, using those techniques, and I think you need the communities engaged and the uh, public advocacy groups to know how to do that. Okay, that sounds great. So thank you very much for all the participation of the audience and also three panelists.